Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be back with you this morning. I especially want to thank our elder Chuck Bowling for the message he brought last week on being strong and courageous. If you missed that, I encourage you to go online and watch it. I welcome all of you who are with us online this morning as well, and this is a great chance for those of you uh, who are here and online to to go ahead and take out your phone and share this live stream, allow the Lord to use you to lead others to Jesus. That's a great thing always for you. Um, We're finishing up a series through the uh, First Peter today. Peter was a commercial fisherman. He was a strong man. He was a passionate man. He became one of the greatest evangelists in the history of the church. And thus far in his letter, he's reminded us that if we belong to Christ, we are literally shielded by God's power. And he's also reminded us of the importance of living a holy life. All right, if we want to be used of God, we need to live a holy life. And then uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Zach shared uh, from, preached from this, and uh, Peter reminding us that, that we, like, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house. The conclusion of Peter's letter is actually longer than everything that came before it. And maybe that's because of the subject, because today he's going to talk to us about suffering. Now, some suffering must be endured. We, we live in a broken world, and that's just the way it is, all right? Some suffering, it, it has to be endured. But believe it or not, some suffering is to be embraced. Not, not endured, but, but embraced. Suffering is not pleasant, but it's necessary, A desire to suffer doesn't make our prayer lists. It certainly doesn't make mine, but it's necessary. And today we're going to discover why. So we're going to be in 1 Peter, starting in chapter 3 with verse 8. And this is the way Peter begins verse 8. He says, finally, okay, finally, he's concluding his letter, but it's a long conclusion. All of you be like-minded. Well, like-minded, sure, but like what? Because it's not enough just to be like-minded with other people. You know, the culture, you know, talks about unity. And what unity means is you can't have any standards, moral standards, all right? And you don't have the right to say anything about anything other than, oh, I'm embracing whatever it is that you embrace, whatever it is that you believe, all right? That, that's being like-minded with, you know, in the world. That's not obviously what he's talking about here. Right? In fact, a lot of you don't want to be like minded with people even just because they're in a church. You know, I can tell you right now, in a 15 minute drive from this church, I could easily take you to a half a dozen churches where virtually every person in the church, including the pastor, is as lost as lost can be. They're not Christians. They don't have the faintest idea what it means to be a Christian. All right, they're, they're not safe. So being like-minded, all right, we're not, we're not talking about just because someone is going to church. We certainly don't want to be like-minded with the world when we look at, you, you know, you look at anything that you see on the news that, 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 that looks close to what hell must be like. When you see the riots and burning the cities and these men and women spewing profanity and, you know, just this kind of thing, anything that looks like hell, okay, what you find is it's people who absolutely hate Jesus, either by their actions or by their words or both, all right? That's just the way they are. We don't want to be like-minded with the world, all right? We, we, just, we just don't. Peter is writing to people who came out of that. They, they came out of that lost directionless, meaningless way of life. They'd gotten saved. So when he says to us, be like-minded, he means like the mind of Christ. He, he means minds that are centered upon God's truth. We, we need minds like Christ. And, and ultimately, that says this, if God said it, I believe it, that's the end of it. Right? That, that's what being like-minded, like the mind of Christ, because Christ himself said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. So to be like-minded, if God said it, I believe it, that's the end of it. That means I don't have the right to hold any opinions that are contrary to what God has clearly spoken. You know, years ago, I was in a, a graduate school program. This was before all of the distance delivery And the only option for me to get the degree that I needed was to go through a secular program. And 
it didn't take very long, although I, I, I was not affrontive, but for the instructor to discover that I was a Christian. And so at one point on a very controversial moral issue where the instructor knew where I stood as a believer, uh, the instructor signal, singled me out in front of the class and said, what is your opinion about? And of course, it was just a trap that, that the professor was waiting for me to answer so that they could attack me. But I said, well, actually, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, and God has already spoken very clearly uh, the truth about this issue, and so I don't have a right to hold any opinion uh, that, that's different from what God has already said. I, I can tell you what God said about this, but I actually don't have an opinion about it. I said, I'd be a hypocrite to say I'm a follower of Christ and then not to follow and that just was a lull, okay, over the deal, okay, because they didn't want to go there, all right, they, and, and they lost their opportunity, right, to, to attack me through that. But you see, that I, I'm not to be like-minded with the world. I'm going to be centered on God's truth. God said it. I believe it. That's the end of it. All right, so going back to verse 8. Finally, all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble Sympathy, love, compassion, and humility. And, and those are all things that say, I hurt when you hurt. I rejoice with your success. I, I agonize with you when you're struggling because I love you. That, that's what those things say. You, you know, some Christians are so jealous of the success of others, even their own siblings, you know, brothers and sisters, they can't even be happy for them when things are going well. You have to teach yourself to dance in your heart at other people's success. You, you just have to teach yourself, and you can just train yourself. that you, you, you Just allow that to light you up, all right, and dance inside at someone else's success, and then just lavish praise on them, okay, for, or for whatever. I mean, this is, this is what God has called us to, right? It's what he's called us to. At the same time, you have to learn to weep with those who weep. True, true compassion, I, I share your burdens, and, and I share, if I'm compassionate, my blessings with you, and, and, and I'm going to share your work. If I'm compassionate, I'm going to share your responsibilities. Compassion draws alongside another person and says, as long as I'm here, you will never have to go through this alone. As long as I'm alive, as long as I'm driving, drawing breath, you will never have to go through this alone. That's what true compassion says. Okay, verse 9. He says, do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech. He must turn from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. Repay evil with blessing. But pastor, do you, you, did you hear what she said to me? Do, do you know what he did to me? Do, do you know what they, what, what they did to us? The answer is no, and I don't want to know. But what I do want to know is how did you repay those evil actions with blessing? What did you do to bless them in response to the nasty way that they treated you? I'd like to hear that. Because that's what you're called to. It's the same thing that I'm called to, right? Keep your tongue from evil. And listen, it's not simply to turn away from evil. God commands you to turn from evil and do good. Seek peace, pursue it. Look at the promise God gives there. He said, whoever would love life and see good days. Now, I know you want to love life. I know you want to see good days. Any man or woman who says that they don't want to love life and see good days is a liar. You want to love life. You want to see good days. So pay attention to this because he said, listen, if... You want this. There's a promise contained here. You want to love life? Do you want to see good days? He doesn't say, do you want every single one of your days to be good? He just says, do you want to see good days? Do, do you want that? Do you want to love life? Do you want to see good days? Then what does he tell us? How do I grab hold of that promise? 
Because I'll tell you, for me, sometimes it seems like life is just passing me like at the speed of a jet airplane, you know? How do I grab on to just love and life when I seem so busy at times and so frantic and rushed all the time? How do you, get, how do you grab hold of that promise? How, as a follower of Christ, can I love life and see good days? Well, he tells us, verse 10 and 11 again, for whoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech. He must turn from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. Now, there are five things that he tells us that we have to do. Listen, you want to love life? You want to see good days? Do these things. Number one, keep your tongue from evil. Cursing, gossip, coarse joking, and speech. He said, you want to love life? Stay away from that. That's not for you. You want to see good days? Not bad days. You want to see good days? Stay away from that. Okay, keep, keep your tongue. Keep your tongue from evil. Second, he said, and deceitful speech, which means never lie. Never lie. Notice he doesn't say always tell the truth. Now, we could say always tell the truth, but here's the thing about that. You don't actually always want to tell the truth. You just want to never lie. Because before I say something, I first ask, is it true? But then I ask, is it necessary? And then I ask, is it kind? Because some things are true, but they're not necessary for us to share. And some things are true and necessary, but if I can't say it in a way that's kind, I have no business saying it. It's not my place. Right? And so it's not that just because it's true doesn't mean that you were sinless in saying it. You can say something very hurtful because it's true, right? Very harmful because it's true. No, it wasn't necessary and it was wrong for you to say it. But you never lie. You keep your tongue from deceit. You, wanna, you, want, you want to love life? You want good days? Then don't lie, all right? No nasty speaking and don't lie. Third, whenever evil is in your path, turn the other way. Okay, change the channel, okay, change the website, change the people you're hanging with, change the place where you're standing. Whenever evil is in your path, turn the other way. You want to love life? You want good days? Turn the other way, okay? Number four, do all the good that you can. If it's in your power to do it, and God has placed it in front of you, He's just literally laid it in your lap, do all the good that you can. We, we, we want to turn from evil when we confront, turn from it. But man, when we have an opportunity to do, good, to do good, we want to take advantage of that. You want to love life? Do good. Do all the good that you can. You want good days? Do all the good that you can. And then number five, seek peace and pursue it. Now, th this is for us because so often the cares of life, they tie us up in knots. We get all anxious and knotted up inside and, you know, somebody was unkind or, or, or said something or there's a stress, you know, at work or there's something going on with the kids, you know, or, or with the spouse in the relationship and, and we get all knotted up and, and if we chase that knotted up, you know, pretty soon we start murmuring and I wish I would have, boy, if I'd have been thinking faster, you know, and that's where you go. And are you loving life right now? Are you having a good day? No, but if you want to love life and you want to have a good day, when you start going, they go, wait, 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 wait. <sighs> Jesus said that, that one of the things that he leaves with us, he said, my peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. He said, I don't give as the world gives. And, and so when you start getting united, you say, man, I got to seek peace. I got to go, go, go to Jesus, go to Jesus, go to Jesus, go to prayer. I got to seek peace. I got to pursue it. You'll find it. You will if you seek it, if you pursue it. And, and then what happens is, instead of being all knotted up inside and all wishing you could have thought faster and been sharper with your tongue and every other thing and, and wishing harm on this other person, uh, you, you know, which, which leaves you in that bad place, instead of that, whew, man, suddenly life is just really good. It wasn't good 15 minutes ago. It's just good. Now, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, suddenly, I'm loving life. Suddenly, I'm having a good day. 
These are the things we want to do. And when we live this way, then things open up in our prayer life. The very next verse, verse 12, he said, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now notice when, it, what, when he talks about evil, this scripture that he's using to warn against evil, it is the evil of retaliation. It started, remember, in verse 9, with do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. And so when he talks about this, the Lord is against those who do evil. He's talking specifically about the evil of retaliating, either with your tongue or with your actions. You see, that's, that's not for us. That, that friend who did you wrong, how about, how about cooking a meal for her family, getting on your knees and praying for her for a half an hour and delivering it? How about, how about getting on your knees and praying for him for a half an hour and taking him a load of wood or some meat for his freezer, you know? That, that bless, 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 bless. That's what's for us. Verse 13. Who is going to harm you if you're eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you're blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. You know, how do you know that you'll be blessed if you suffer for doing the right thing? Because Jesus told us. In Matthew 5, 11 and 12, he said, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. See, it's not fun to be insulted. It's not fun to be persecuted or bullied or lied about. But when these things come because you are taking a stand for Christ, because you refuse to get drunk with your coworkers, because you refuse you, you know, to sleep around or live an immoral life, because you, you go to church like now when the world is sleeping or sinning their life away, it, when, 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 you're, when the persecution, when the insults come, when the rejection or the mocking come, because you're standing for Christ, Jesus, Jesus would say, look, I know it's hard to be insulted, but rejoice in your heart because you are standing up for me and your Father in heaven is going to reward you. So listen, you're standing in the right place. It's just his promise. Yet yeah, not, it's no fun, but rejoice in your heart because you are standing in the right place. Your Father in heaven sees it. He's going to reward you, okay? He's going to reward you. Verse 15, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. That word revere is hagios. It literally means to make holy at Christ as Lord. And that word Lord is literally the one who owns you. So in your heart, establish Christ as the one who owns you. He's your master. That's what Lord means. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it's better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. See, when we suffer for that very same reason, to bring others to God, that suffering for doing right is blessed by God. So step out and do it, right? What that means is stop pretending that your grandma is saved because it makes you feel better and tell her about Jesus. Stop pretending that your mom and dad are saved because it makes you feel better and tell them about Jesus. Stop pretending that your adult sons and daughters are saved because it makes you feel better and tell them about Jesus. Stop, stop hiding your faith with your classmates and with your coworkers. So we have to step up, right? We have to step up and do the thing that God has called us to do because if we suffer in order to bring others to God, if we suffer because we are standing for Christ, God says, listen, that is just a blessed place for you to live. That is the suffering 
that we don't simply endure, but suffering that we embrace. It's the suffering for doing right. God says it's a good thing. It's a good thing. Why, why, why did Christ suffer? Why did God the Father allow it? Why didn't the Holy Spirit unleash a blast of power from heaven and destroy all of Christ's enemies? Why didn't God send legions of angels to destroy the people, to prevent them from beating and torturing Christ and nailing him to a cross? Why didn't God do that? Well, verse 18 tells us again, right? Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. This is why God didn't stop it, all right? Because he was bringing he was doing it to bring us to God. Verse 14, if you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Now that's a statement of fact. It's a statement of truth. That's not a statement that is for one person and not for another person or for one individual circumstance and not for another. Any person, any one of us at any time, if we suffer because we are standing for Jesus, if we're mocked, if we're ridiculed, if we're persecuted, if we're left out, all right, because we're standing for Jesus, the, the veil of heaven opens and the spirit of, the, of glory and of God rests on you. It, it, it's a promise. What an amazing place to stand. And suddenly that thing that you thought was going to be so awful and so horrible, and suddenly you're standing in this place where you have peace because the spirit of glory and of God is resting on you. And all you'll be able to do is bow your head and say, thank you, Lord, for the privilege of tasting just a little bit of what you tasted, of going through just a tiny bit of what you went through. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. But you know, this is the very place. It's the very place, this place of suffering, where so many people fall short. Verse 15 says, if you suffer... It should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or even a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it's time for judgment to begin with God's household, and if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it's hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then... Those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. But that place of suffering, suffering for our faith, this is where so many people who hear the gospel and they're captivated by God's story and they're hungry to be forgiven, but this is the place where they walk away. They walk away. I listened to a Hollywood superstar being interviewed at the height of his fame. He was, he was young. He was handsome. He was athletic. He was popular. He was wealthy. When the interview asked about his spiritual life, he said that when he was younger, he tried Christianity for a while, but it really wasn't for him. And, and of course, what, what does that mean? He tried it all right, right, until he was mocked. Until somebody called him names, until he tried it until he was laughed at or he was made the butt of, uh, of joking. He tried it until he was disinvited to parties where the cool people were hanging out, right? But like so many others, he was unwilling to suffer for the name Christian, and so he walked away. And as far as I know, he's in hell today. But he didn't have to suffer for taking a stand for Christ. God calls us to stand in the face of mocking and ridicule and insults. And, and don't imagine that I haven't tasted this, and some of it from my own family and friends. See, but it doesn't make any difference to me if the demons from hell offered me every kind of pleasure in the world, or, 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 if, or, or if Satan himself wrote and published every kind of lie about me and published it across the world, God is my defender and I'm going to stand. I'm going to stand, I'm going to stand, I'm going to stand, and I am happy to suffer for the name of Christ. I'll tell you, you know, in this world, of course, it's a broken world, and so everybody's going to suffer uh, on some level. But apart from the suffering that just has nothing to do with our decisions, it's just a part of living in a broken world, apart from that, everyone is still going to suffer. And either you're going to suffer the consequences of your sin-centered, self-centered life, 
or you're going to suffer for being man enough or woman enough or teenager or child enough to stand for the gospel of Jesus Christ in the middle of a lost and dying world. One way or another, everybody's going to suffer. It's just a matter, are you going to suffer for your faith and your stand and your obedience and your conviction, or are you going to suffer for the lack of it? Peter's next counsel starts to the elders among you. And those who are elders, who are mature in their faith, those are the ones who you know are going to stand. And what does it mean when we talk about to stand? Well, if you stand for your faith, then you stand for the unborn. You stand for God's design for marriage. You stand for prayer in school. You stand for God in the culture. You stand for the word of God. You stand for the necessity of sharing the gospel. And so Peter starts to the elders among you, but then in verse 5, okay, he says, in the same way you who are younger, and by this we know that he's not talking about simply appointed elders in the authority structure of the church. Instead, he's talking about mature believers who have been down the trail a ways and who are standing solid in their faith, okay, who have a degree of wisdom because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and so that fear of the Lord plus time, serving and worshiping and praising and learning, you, you know, this is how we grow wise. So when he talks about the elders among you, there were elders in the early church who were probably no older than Jesus in, his, in, in their early 30s, right? There may have been some elders who were younger than that, but they'd been with Jesus already for years, all right? They were mature in their faith. Uh, and then there are those who are younger, younger in their faith. And so he talks about now first about the elders, and he said to the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders, all of you, speaking to those who are younger, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. So, so we're to humble ourselves under God's mighty hand. And I'll tell you where this hit home in my own life. I was in my middle or later 30s. I'd been a Christian about a decade I, I had served in, in ministry in every church I think that I'd been a part of, and I was not in ministry then, and about this time God led us to a little tiny church with one of the most effective evangelist and discipling pastors I've ever known. But here's the deal, as an elder, he exercised authority. Here's what that looked like. He assigned every adult to, the, to a Sunday school class. He not only said, I expect you to be here, then he assigned you. He said, no, 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 you're at this table. He assigned you. He required every church member to serve in a ministry. And if you were the leader in a ministry, whether with children or teenagers or adults, then he required after every single meeting that by the following day, you had to give him a written report of who was in attendance, who was new, how those new people responded uh, to the gospel, and what you intended to do that week to follow up with them. That needed to be written the next day. And I want to tell you, these were rules, not suggestions. And you know how I responded? I absolutely resisted that authority in my spirit. I was obstinate. I was prideful. I was resentful. That just rankled me that he was exercising that authority. I, I did what he asked of me, but I did it with a wrong heart. I did it, but I did it with a wrong heart and not without murmuring. And then something amazing happened. I led more people to Christ in the next 10 months than I had led to the Lord in the previous 10 years. Because this man demanded it of me. He didn't ask me to do a single thing that he couldn't e easily defend in the Scripture. He didn't say a single word that was not clearly within his authority to speak to me. But I was independent. I'd been a Christian. 
I'd been serving. See, and God needed to teach me something about humility and what it meant to come under and my willingness to obey even though I had a wrong heart, which in some respects is disobedience, but my willingness to do what he asked is what God used to teach me something that I could have learned no other way. He knew that I needed specifically to come under the authority of a godly leader, an elder who exercised biblical authority and said, this is the bar, this is the standard, it's not negotiable. God needed that. I'd, I'd already surrendered my life to ministry. I couldn't figure out why God wasn't opening any doors for me. I was looking all over America, offering myself place after place after place. I had 84 resumes out, applications out, didn't get a single response because I wasn't ready. There was something wrong in my heart. I wasn't willing to come under. Thank you, Jesus. Now I'm willing to come under anybody. The Holy Spirit lays a leader in my path. My only question is, how can I help? What can I do? What do you need of me? Thank you, Jesus. It's a privilege. It's a blessing. Chapter 5, verse 8. Peter went on, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. See, once the devil loses the battle for your soul, he wages war against your usability for God's kingdom. See, he doesn't want you leading anybody else to Jesus. So he fills your mind with fears and insecurities about sharing your faith and, and, and reminds you of every sin you ever committed and who do you think you are. And, and he tries to, to attack your value as a son or a daughter of the king. And, and if you believe those lies, man, he'll just cripple you. He'll, he'll cripple you if you believe him. But you see, if you're a child of God, if you're a Christian, then... We don't have to worry about Satan's attacks. We, we, we want to remember that he attacks so he doesn't catch us off guard. But it's not a matter of worry for us. 1 John 4, 4 says, You, dear children, are from God, and you've overcome them, Satan and his demons. Why? You've overcome them because the one who's in you is greater than he was in the world. So all I have to do is say, I rebuke you, Satan, in the name of Jesus, and he can't lay a finger on me. I'm shielded by God's power until the return of Christ. He can't touch me. And he can't touch you either. Don't allow him in. He has no right to access to you. He has no right. He has no claim. Jesus said in Luke 21, 19, stand firm and you will win life. You say, well, I try to stand firm. I just can't do it. It's the same sin just grabs me again and again and again. And, and the same fears grab me again and again and again. Well, it's because you're relying on your own strength. 2 Corinthians 1.21 says, Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. You have to go straight to the Lord. Help me. Lord Jesus, help me. He will. He will. 1 Corinthians 15.58 says, Stand firm. Let nothing move you. 16.13 says, Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. Galatians 5.1 Stand firm and do not allow yourselves to be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Philippians 1.27 Stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. Colossians 4.12 Stand firm in all the will of God. 2 Thessalonians 2.15 Stand firm and hold fast to the teachings we passed on to you. James 5.8 Be patient and stand firm firm because the Lord's coming is near. It's near. He's coming. He's coming. And then Peter concludes, starting in verse 10, and the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you've suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and be your foundation. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. He says he's going to restore you, literally make you perfect. And he's also going to make you strong, He's going to make you firm, in other words, unshakable, and he's going to be your foundation. These are the promises that he brings. This is why 
We don't run from the suffering that comes along with being a son or a daughter of the king. Some suffering in life must be endured. It's painful. It's difficult. This is why it says when we get to heaven one day, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There'll still be tears. There's a lot of suffering in this world. We just have to endure it. But some suffering, that's suffering because I'm standing for Jesus. That's to be embraced. If you have never responded personally to the gospel of Jesus Christ, you know, I'm so thankful I grew up in a church attending home, but the church I grew up in didn't preach the gospel, okay? Never heard what it meant to be a Christian, never heard how to become a Christian, assumed I was a Christian like everybody I ever knew assumes that you're Christians. Why? Because you go to church and because you say things like, I believe in God. Oh yeah, I believe the Christmas story. Yeah, I believe the Easter story. And yet the Bible says you say that you believe there is one God, good for you. The demons believe that and they tremble. It's more than just saying I believe. If you believe that Jesus is, truly is the Son of God, the crucified and risen Savior of the world, you must come to Him confessing your sin what you and God already know, okay, if you stood before God accused of breaking any of his laws, okay, he'd have no choice but to call you guilty. You confess it to him. You ask him to forgive you and to save you, right? You surrender this life that you're living today. You surrender it to him and say, from this moment forward, I'm yours. You do that, and the promise of God is that he will turn away none of those who come by faith. The Bible says to all who receive him, a gift must be received. Okay, I can hold out a $100 bill all day long, but if you don't take it, it's not a gift for you. To all who receive him, to those who call on his name, he gives the right to become. It's a right to become. You become something that you're not right now. He gives the right to become children of God. If that's your heart and you've never in a moment in time asked him to forgive you and save you, we want to give you that opportunity right now. We'll all bow and pray with you. Just bow your head right now. You can say this prayer out loud or softly, your heart to God's. Jesus, I do believe you're the son of God. I believe that you died on a cross to pay for my sins and the sins of the whole world. And I believe you rose again. I confess to you that I'm a sinner. You know the things that I've thought and said and done. I know that I'm guilty and I'm asking you, please forgive me. I'm asking you, Jesus, to save me and take me to heaven to be with you when I die. And right now, Jesus, by faith, because you promised, I'm receiving the gift that you offer, forgiveness and a brand new life, eternal life. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for speaking truth into my heart today. Thank you for saving me. Show me now how to live in a way that pleases you.